So good morning everyone and welcome to today's book release webinar with the topic competition data and privacy in the digital economy. And my name is uh, Maria Vasasharna. I'm a partner uh, and a co-head of competition and procurement at Hannes Snellman Attorneys here in Helsinki. And I'm also the author of the book Competition Data and Privacy in the Digital Economy that you can also see displayed here on the slide. Uh, before joining Hannes Snellman a little more than a year ago, I worked as an in-house counsel for several years, most recently at Nokia. And I have also experience from the competition enforcers uh, from the European Commission in Brussels and from the US Federal Trade Commission in Washington, DC. And I'm very happy to have with me here today, uh, Professor Anu Bradford, and I will let her introduce herself. Thank you, Maria. Good morning, everyone. I am delighted to uh, be here to discuss uh, Maria's book, which I think couldn't be more topical and couldn't be more important. Something that we all in the United States are watching with great uh, interest and that is really shaping the competition landscape and the conversation in Europe and around the world. Um, as Maria said, I am uh, teaching at Columbia Law School. Uh, I uh, teach uh, antitrust and EU law and international trade. Um, I also direct the Center for European Legal Studies there. I um, have practiced law in the past at Cleary Gottlieb in Brussels, so I do have a European background, but for the past uh, 20 years I have been studying Europe and uh, studying competition law from the United States. So very happy to have you, Anu, here here with me today. So just briefly a few words about the agenda uh, before we get started. So um, a few practical points. We uh, have close to 150 uh, participants um, registered for the webinar. So any questions will be, will be um, uh, directed through the chat. So if you want to post questions, please, please type them in the chat and we will be picking them up from there as we go and also towards the end of the webinar, we will have time to, to, to uh, address your questions. The webinar is scheduled to, to take some 45 minutes, so it will be a very uh, intense brief package. Um, but if I start by just briefly um, uh, telling you what my book is about, and, or perhaps more why I wrote this book, and uh, if you want to jump to the next slide, please. Um, the topic of my research and what was then to become a doctoral dissertation and now also this book published in, in uh, August by Walter Kluver, um, this began to take shape in my mind when I was working in a, as an in-house competition counsel at Nokia, which is a multinational technology company, as you probably all know, at least all the Finnish participants. And I was involved during those years in some very fascinating antitrust cases against Google concerning Google's practices uh, with regard to the search function, but also the Android operating system. Because Nokia was part of this coalition called Fair Search that was advocating um, fair competition and innovation and consumer choice across the internet. And other big tech companies such as Microsoft and Oracle were also part of this coalition. And during this time, I had the privilege of following from sort of a front row seat the developments and the increasing discourse on the digital transformation and the role of data in competition law as a competition advantage. And I got really intrigued by these new questions about the implications for competition law um, and, and the functioning of the markets of, of the data economy. And, uh, this all actually led me then to start researching the very role of data and personal data, so in other words, privacy in competition law um, due to the digital transformation. And uh, with the transition from the price driven, driven to the data driven economy, um, our society has really grown to rely on products and services that are free of charge to consumers. But because these services have no monetary price, um, there's a bit of hesitation whether action should, should follow with regard to these um, uh, services and, and companies' practices concerning those. 
And my, my book then questions whether competition policy is actually too fixated on the idea that the only real harm consists of raising prices. Because consumers today pay for supposedly free online offerings by giving away their personal information. And when, men, when many products and services seem free in online markets with user data then as a sort of invisible cost, looking only at price effects in competition law is actually quite misleading. So what my book essentially asserts is that an overly price-centered approach risks overlooking significant welfare harms that relate to important non-price parameters of competition, such as privacy and consumer choice as well. And I want to emphasize that I, I don't doubt that digitalization offers fantastic potential for doing business more efficiently, for making better use of resources, and also improving people's lives. I mean, myself as a consumer, I love my Gmail account and I use Facebook still, despite the privacy scandals we've seen regarding the company and so on. But at the same time, there is a growing concern with the collection and use of consumer data. And these invite questions about the application of competition law to data. For example, when we think about how to establish market power. And today, instead of talking about monopolies in the traditional sense, there are new concepts that we will talk about today with ANO, such as dataopolis and digital gatekeepers that are emerging. And the slide here with the digital hand, if we just go back for a while to the previous slide, this refers to the fact that this new economic reality with data and analytics um, is changing the dynamics. And I argue in my book that competition might actually be driven by different forces. And often consumers, all of us uh, here today as well, we don't really have an exact idea about how and the extent to which uh, um, our data is possibly, possibly being used for, for different purposes when we hand over our information online. And here um, I draw an analogy uh, between the, the 1998 American movie, The Truman Show, starring Jim Carrey, uh, which is a very controlled environment, which is nothing more than a facade. And while such an environment may deliver relative well-being to its subjects, the main beneficiary is the controller of the ecosystem. So arguably today, the big tech companies. Um, and then today with the changes that relate to the data economy and evolving data-driven businesses, the arising concern is that this invisible hand, which should be steering the free market uh, and safeguard consumer welfare, is actually being replaced by the digital hand. And then maybe a few words uh, concerning the next slide um, that we already got a glimpse of is that one key takeaway of my book, and then, then I'll stop so we can start actually the conversation with Anu, is that I think history in some sense is actually repeating itself. And this was a really surprising finding during my research. I didn't expect then when I started looking into the role of data in competition policy, that in some ways history is repeating itself. But I realized that already decades ago, there were concerns about restricting the goals of competition only to economic issues and about excluding certain political values in interpreting the laws. And today, with the growing concerns about market concentration and politicians proposing regulation or breakup of companies, it's really the same debate that we're seeing. And um, it can be sort of visualized as a crossroads where competition policy is proposed to be rethought as it was back in 1890. And this anti-monopoly cartoon, The Menace of the Hour from 1899, illustrates the sort of populist view of monopolies and especially of Standard Oil, a company that was then broken up in the US to 34 business entities. And then this image from 2018 reflects um, a technology octopus with the powers and influence of the tech giants, Amazon, Apple, Facebook and Google, with their broad implications that are economic, political, reaching all the way to the White House on the image, and also societal. And then the legal risks and privacy intrusion, uh, which is then illustrated by, by the octopus getting into the minds of people on their phones. I'll stop here, and, and this was sort of a brief overview of why I started writing this book and researching the topic and, and some of my initial findings.
Um, thank you, Maria, for uh, that overview. It is really a rich account that is both uh, persuasively argued and beautifully written. And um, in the interest of time, we only can touch on a few of the issues that you raise in the book. But let me maybe uh, go to the next slide and uh, just remind uh, us of where we are today. If you look at the economy's cover, what is the most valuable resource we have today? What is the oil uh, of the day? And it is data. And um, if you look at now, what is keeping the competition in forces busy? It is all about the big tech companies and their data practices and how those change the marketplace. So if we look at this uh, ongoing uh, case against uh, or investigating the Google Fitbit proposed uh, acquisition, can you maybe, Maria, uh, remind us how we got there? And if you look at the recent history, um, this is only the, the latest one of the set of cases where competition and privacy intersect. So we had a Facebook WhatsApp case. We had Microsoft LinkedIn. But you document in your book that something is changing in how we look at these transactions. So do you actually believe that this change is already going to be reflected in the cases like the Google Fitbit? And if so, why are we seeing this kind of transformation? So yes, when I started researching the topic in 2016, so that's four years ago, uh, this question was still quite a novel one and some were asking how can you even combine competition law and privacy, how are these two interlinked and during the course of four years so much has happened. We have seen a sort of uh, tide of cases, of studies, of reports by both competition authorities and data protection authorities about the role of data and these sort of growing concerns about user privacy online. And at the same time, we've seen how public media is really engaging in the discourse as well, as reflected in this The Economist uh, first page. And I think one sort of culmination point might actually be this Google Fitbit merger that the European Com Commission is now uh, uh, looking into uh, more in depth, uh, as, uh, as are also other competition authorities around the world. For example, the Australian competition is authorities also considering this merger. And I think how this, this merger might be different from the previous cases you mentioned, for example, the, the Facebook WhatsApp merger and Microsoft LinkedIn. We could also throw in Google DoubleClick or Apple Shazam. There's been quite a few of these data-driven mergers. But how this case is perhaps different is that this really goes to the most intimate personal data that we as users share online. So uh, many are probably familiar with these Fitbit products that they're wrist-worn smart, smart watches and these so-called fitness trackers. And they track our daily activities and then we provide a lot of health information um, to these uh, services. So basically Fitbit controls one of the world's largest health and fitness social networks and, and databases. So if Google was allowed to purchase Fitbit, it would get some 30 million users data and be able to monetize advertising through the use of this data. So here I think competition authorities, after having accepted without any commitments or remedies, uh, several data-driven mergers, now are stopping to think, do, is this where we, we have to draw the line? Is this going too far? especially because we are talking about some, something so intimate as, as, as health data. Um, there have been talks uh, which have been interesting to follow where Google has sort of made promises that they, they wouldn't um, merge these data sets. There's been a commitment of a so-called data silo. Um, also, Google has claimed that data is actually not a driver of this deal so much, but this is perhaps a little bit questionable because uh, then uh, if, if, they, if data wasn't really the driver, they could put up some maybe technology licensing agreements or patent licensing agreements to, uh, instead of, of actually purchasing the service. So it's gonna be very interesting to see how the commission will, will solve this case because at the same time, um, imposing a sort of remedy or commitment um, instead of blocking the deal of perhaps forcing Google to, to, to share data might not actually be the best outcome either. But I think the, 
at least the competition community and probably the the, the wider uh, society as well is, is really watching this case with a lot of interest because it might be quite decisive for the future developments of, of, of this very topic. Absolutely. And I think the question of remedies is a really fascinating one. So what should be done if there are concerns about the, the data sharing and other practices? And we will be returning to that topic towards the end of our time. But let's now move on to look at another case that is truly pathbreaking, and that takes us to Germany. So what we've seen is this fascinating case, very uh, brave, by German competition authority, whereby they went after Facebook uh, and, and found that the Facebook's infringements of the privacy right did not just constitute a violation of GDPR and German privacy regulations, but a violation of competition law. It can be considered an abuse of a dominant position. So can you, Maria, tell a little bit about how you assess this particular case uh, in your book? Whether and what is the advantage of going after Facebook uh, through competition law as opposed to privacy law? What is the competition as opposed to data protection harm in this particular case? So this German Facebook case actually it started in 2016 uh, when the German competition authority, the Bundeskartell, opened an investigation against Facebook, and I think very few were expecting that then four years later the outcome would be that the, the highest court in Germany would side with the competition authority and ac actually say that, that they agree that uh, Facebook has been abusing its, its market position based on privacy breaches. This is really sort of groundbreaking um, and, and really sort of stretching the, the competition laws to, very, to a very <laughs> high extent, and this decision has been very much criticized as well. Um, in brief, the, the argument that the competition authority in Germany made is that due to the company's size, the consumers have no choice but to accept the terms and conditions that Facebook is imposing. And these terms are unfair in the sense that they require the user to really give away a lot of personal information without understanding for what purpose and how that data will then be used by Facebook. And uh, interestingly, the German Competition Authority relied quite a lot on data protection rules. So it even sort of maybe arguably exceeded its boundaries of, of enforcing not only competition rules, but also data protection rules. Then again, in this um, final decision by the Supreme Court in, in Germany, what is actually more emphasized than the role of data in the end is the role of consumer choice, that, you, that users um, need to have a, a, an honest uh, or at least real choice when, when, um, when, when using Facebook services. And um, the consent that they give uh, to Facebook terms and conditions was regarded as illusory in, in this case, that they really didn't have an option. It was take it or leave it, basically. And if all your friends are on Facebook, you, most of the users, they actually take it without really realizing what they are opting in for. But then to your question, why go after uh, Facebook through competition laws instead of privacy laws, or what's the difference? So simplifying a little bit, when privacy laws they look at information asymmetries. Competition laws, they look at power asymmetries. So, so competition laws want to preserve um, consumer choice and then data protection wants to sort of protect the exercise of, of that choice for consumers. So both set of laws, they intervene to address problematic market behavior, but they do so at different points at the same spectrum. I think this German case is fascinating because it combines the two sets of, of policy areas or, or legal fields by looking at the, the shared interests that they have and then they use both of them in, in a very interesting way that hasn't been done before. And while this is a national case, it's going to be interesting to see if there will be effects beyond borders and if other competition authorities um, around the world, but perhaps especially in Europe, might get inspired from this quite um, um, well, sort of experimental way of, of uh, enforcing the law.
So I completely agree, Maria, these, the ramifications go far beyond Germany. And uh, I think there's an additional reason why this can be a very attractive path for many different countries. And, and one of them is that the data protection agencies are not as well resourced and not as well developed around the world. Whereas the competition agencies often have both more resources and more experience. So it might provide an attractive path if you want to hold big, powerful companies into account that you can tap into your more resourceful branch of the government uh, agencies. So we'll see whether uh, and what the developments are both in Germany and, uh, and outside after this case. But um, I want to now move to the next slide and uh, to some of those issues that you raise here. So you talk about what consumers actually care about. And there's at least an assumption behind this case that the consumers don't just want to have free products. They actually value the quality of the products, including the extent to which their privacy is being respected. You talk a lot about choice as a critical value for consumers. So I was hoping that you can tell a little bit more about your thinking that you elaborate in the book of how we would think about privacy as a dimension of a product quality and hence element uh, of competition. And interestingly, how can we measure it? Mm. So I think uh, first we sort of need to take a step back and, and sort of remind ourselves that competition law uh, why do we have it? Well, we have it to, to protect consumer welfare. And uh, consumer welfare has become um, something that we think of mainly in terms of price. So in the, in the last years um, or decades when competition authorities enforce competition rules with the aim of protecting the consumer welfare in the market, it's really about having sufficiently low uh, prices on products and services. But when I said that we need to take a step back, we need to remind ourselves that actually it's, we have both price and non-price uh, related parameters that relate to competition. So consumers don't only value uh, price when they buy a product, they also value quality, uh, they value innovation, new products, uh, they want to have choice as well to be able to choose choose freely what products and services to use. So when I argue that privacy can be a dimension in, in competition law, I really describe it as a qualitative element of a product. And this is already being recognized that when products and services are increasingly free, so without a monetary price uh, online, it's actually more the other parameters, the non-price parameters that drive consumer choice. So for example, uh, it's been seen that users actually value the data protection element in a service that they are using. Um, and, and this is really important because that means we have to shift our way of thinking about competition law as only a very price-centered tool. It has to become wider to be able to sort of actually reflect modern day markets which are data driven but also modern day society where the consumer is not as simple as only uh, a, a very rational sort of price driven uh, uh, actor on the market but really so, uh, somebody who values more dimensions and uh, i emphasize in my book especially consumer choice and this goes actually back to the very roots of why competition laws were initially uh, enacted, especially in Europe. It was essentially to preserve consumer choice and to ensure that there are uh, enough competitors on the market so that you don't only have that one go-to uh, service or go-to product. And then I also emphasize the principle of fairness something that we've actually heard a lot about uh, in the last years, especially coming from Brussels, from competition commissioner Vestager, who's been quite an active sort of advocate for the principle of fairness in competition law, which is perhaps a little bit different from the, the discourse that you have in the US. Uh, but I'll let you, Anu, maybe comment on that uh, as you're better placed to do it than myself. Yeah, so let's still stay for a moment. I think this is so fascinating and a really a critical uh, uh, argument in your book, this consumer choice and, uh, and the, the question of what do we assume at least that the consumers care about. 
So if we thought about and took this choice seriously, would you think it would be adequate to offer consumers a choice to pay for the services with their data or with money? So you have a choice of engaging on these platforms in and, and, and get your Google search uh, for free, uh, meaning in terms of uh, in exchange for your data, or then you have a monthly subscription fee and you would have the same, for instance, uh, for Facebook. So maybe two part question. So first of all, would this satisfy the idea that we are giving the consumers a genuine choice? And the second um, is that how would we then, what do you think the consumers would choose? And, and then what would be then the choice in terms of how much would be the fee that you would accept uh, in return for accepting the data? Is it measured in terms of how valuable this data is for you or how valuable it is for, for instance, Facebook? Now you really go to the sort of the heart of the problem or one of the most difficult questions that I tackle in my book. And that really is about how do you measure privacy? And then uh, this relates to the question, how do you measure quality? It's such a subjective element. Probably you and I might measure it in different ways and not to think of all the participants of this webinar. We all have probably quite different perceptions of what is good quality and also depending on which product, which context we talk about. Uh, would we talk about cars? I wouldn't have a clue. But maybe if we talk about something more close to my heart, I have very specific sort of expectations on quality. So this is really one of the key challenges um, in the data-driven um, sort of markets where privacy is, is becoming such a crucial dimension that how should competition authorities be able to measure this if they were to include it in their assessment when assessing a merger or, or problematic um, uh, conduct by, by a dominant company. But it, interestingly, there's quite a few methodologies and also estimation techniques that have been developed in the last years. And I discuss these in quite some detail in my book, and I won't go into them now, but just to sort of mention some examples, how you can um, actually measure privacy or the value of personal data. So you could look at the market prices that are available for, for, for certain user data, such as a street address or um, a date of birth, a social security num number. There are actually values put on these, uh, these data. You could also use financial results for data um, as a record. Then you could estimate data through costs of a data breach. Or, for example, look at um, what's the price for a data insurance. So um, these are just some examples of how to address this challenge. And it shows that it's not impossible to give privacy uh, some kind of measurement. And just because it's a challenging task, in my view, doesn't mean that we shouldn't sort of we shouldn't do it or try to try to address this uh, in in a better way because. The fact is that over the last years, we have sort of chosen to measure only the very simple things, such as euro price, instead of other things that are perhaps today even more valuable, such as data protection, because the markets have changed so much with the digital transformation. So sort of a, uh, in welcome the, the developments of the last years where we see competition um, authorities quite bravely now addressing these big, big questions in various reports and studies. And they really sort of um, are sort of accepting that the world is changing and also the, the competition law enforcement needs to sort of keep up with that speed. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I, I like the argument of the way you frame it, that you don't let really be the perfect, the enemy of the good. And, uh, and I was more persuaded after your book that there are ways to try to put price on privacy. And if you think about the, the idea that the consumers are very heterogeneous and everybody values privacy differently, that's not a novel problem for competition law. Even when you define the markets and think about which products are considered substitutes, I think consumers are very different in who is willing to trade to another product if the price of one of their preferred products goes up. So it is, it is a problem that I think competition tools, competition law tools have been dealing with for quite some time. Um, but let me now maybe uh, turn the conversation a little bit. You mentioned the United States, and I think there's a terrific analysis in the book comparing the European approach to that of the US. And um, 
it is really fascinating to see how the conversation is changing after having been quite stable for a long time, that the United States is really starting to rethink whether it has failed to protect the consumers through its competition laws. So let's move to the next slide. And that uh, gives you a, uh, a picture from a very recent hearing, the congressional hearing where uh, Google and Facebook and Apple and Amazon all were invited together to uh, respond to the various allegations of how much consumer harm they have generated through the infringement of US antitrust laws. So this is really a potentially pivotal moment. We still don't know whether this leads to various enforcement actions, but we have heard that the Department of Justice is now going after Google building uh, uh, one of its biggest tech cases. And it'll be interesting to see whether that actually comes to fruition. There's been some really interesting academic commentary uh, recently on the failures of American antitrust law to rein in the powerful monopolies. There's a fantastic book that I recommend by a French economist, Thomas Philippon, who is a professor at NYU, and he wrote this book called The Great Reversal, How America Gave Up on Free Markets. And he shows how the luck of competition in the United States that he largely attributes to the lack of antitrust enforcement has led to massive increase in profits to the companies and massive increase in the prices that the consumers pay. So, and he contrasts that to the European markets, which are much more competitive. And it's something that it goes against this conventional thinking that we have had of the dynamic competitive marketplace in the US and the lack thereof. Uh, in Europe. So I think there's really a foundation to ask the question of whether the US should potentially start following the path of the EU and, and start enforcing uh, its antitrust laws as well, as opposed to outsourcing, if you like, all these antitrust battles uh, to Brussels. So I wanted to get your take on um, whether you believe that this tide is turning also in the US and um, if it is not, are you worried about the growing divergence of the transatlantic approach to both privacy and then uh, most importantly here to uh, antitrust? And if you do see a change, do you believe the US moving towards the EU as well? Yeah, it's, it's been interesting because also in this regard, um, a lot has happened over the last years and, and as you mentioned there's quite a change uh, now going on so if, if we look back a few years it wasn't really visible that the US was following this development that was already ongoing in Brussels where um, we were considering more widely sort of the purpose of competition law and should consumer welfare be understood more as consumer well-being as sort of a broader concept but now over the last year the debate is really ongoing also in the US, especially with these congressional hearings uh, with the CEOs of the, of the biggest tech companies because of concerns of uh, monopoly power and very concentrated markets. So I would say the tide is turning and that more broadly also in the US we are waking up um, uh, to, to these sort of concerns um, about uh, uh, which, which relate to, to, to the tech companies sort of dominance, if you want. And interestingly, um, in The Economist in, 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 in August um, this year, there was a, a piece with the topic um, or headline, what more should antitrust be doing? So this is really also something that is very much recognized in the public um, media. Um, another interesting example which might be familiar to some of the participants of this webinar or and if it isn't i warmly recommend you to to take a look at it it's a uh, a new movie um on on netflix called the social dilemma and this is sort of a, a sort of more concrete example of how i think more broadly we are waking up to the concerns that relate to the big tech companies power not only when it comes to privacy and user data, but perhaps even more broadly talking about democracy and, uh, and uh, popular, uh, popularization and, and polarization today. And uh, this also relates to one aspect that I want to mention before I comment on your question of, of the risks of a diver divergence. And uh, 
that is uh, the role of behavioral economics and that's something that I raise in my book uh, also as a sort of um, maybe a tool how to address the challenges um, when, when it comes to measuring privacy and understanding consumer behavior that takes place online because this behavior is quite different sometimes than behavior in the sort of offline world and this relates to the fact that consumers are actually very irrational uh, and uh, for example you we talk about this privacy paradox that I also describe in my book and that many users feel quite concerned about their privacy online but still they continue sharing and increasingly share a lot of personal data and uh, I also describe these um, uh, this, um, uh, phenomena such as the free effect and, uh, and the artificial lock-in feeling so that uh, if something is free you're sort of lured to use it even more and then uh, once you started using for example an application on your phone you sort of feel artificially locked in you hesitate to switch to another app because you're lazy you don't want the additional learning costs so I mean this is really irrational behavior even if you know that perhaps that application doesn't protect your privacy at all and it, myself included I behave like this quite quite a lot with my apps on the phone and uh, so, so what I argue is my book that by understanding better behavioral economics and how we as consumers are irrational and, and by bringing these learnings to competition law actually we could make much better use of, of the competition tools because currently we, we, we rely on sort of traditional uh, uh, economic thinking which always assumes that the consumer is perfectly rational and only makes rational decisions and, and we all know this is not really the, the way the, uh, the world works. But then to your question on the e EU and US divergence, so I think absolutely uh, it would be a very big risk if we see here that the approach in the, in the EU and the US go separate ways um, I mean, this would cause a lot of legal uncertainty, especially for businesses that operate on a global scale. Uh, you could have divergent outcomes in cases depending on if they are enforced in Brussels or in DC. I mean, that, 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 that is not really good for, for business, not for, for legal certainty. If identical business conduct could be treated completely differently based on where that case is pursu pursued. This would also create a policy divide. And then we've seen cases in the past where the outcome has been completely different. For example, the Google search and Android cases took very different turns um, when, when the European, Com European Commission was looking at them uh, and then when the, when the FTC was investigating the same. So I do feel some concern if, if we go very, uh, towards very separate directions in, in the EU and in the US with regard to this question. So Maria, we are approaching soon the end of our time, but I uh, wanted to take a question from the audience, which goes directly into this point of how much uh, do the consumers really care about privacy? And, and should we think about the consumers being irrational, not fully internalizing the cost uh, when they do give out uh, their data? And whether maybe regulatory paternalism is then some kind of an answer that competition law should intervene based on what we think should be in the interest of the consumers. But uh, Joachim Hilden uh, asked about your claim that privacy is a dimension of the quality of the product and how we can defend it because we're, often there are privacy preserving options to the dominant entities, but those are not chosen by the majority of the consumer. So, uh, for instance, if we go to the Google Fitbit uh, uh, merger, um, if there are other options such as the Apple uh, Watch, should we then be concerned? Should we intervene? Should we assume that the consumers care or should care about the privacy if their behavior indicates that they don't? Yeah, that, I, I think that goes back to my point about the rational consumer and, and the role of behavioral economics uh, that should be brought into that kind of an assessment. And also it goes to your point of sort of paternalism. How far should we stretch competition law? Should it protect the consumer from itself? Isn't that going too far and actually diminishing the role of consumer choice in the end? I mean, these are huge questions that um, we, we don't have time to sort of to address in, in, in much detail in this webinar. But I think here um, 
an interesting sort of uh, parallel can be drawn to a very uh, hot topic right now, also in competition law, that's sustainability. And here again, we can talk about the irrational cons consumer, sort of, um, instead of a privacy paradox, we can talk about an eco paradox. The consumer claims that, oh, it really cares about the environment and is very concerned about climate change. But then to get these short-term gains, uh, it, it does uh, actions contrary to these claims. And here we could pose the question, I think quite rightfully so, if there shouldn't be perhaps an element of paternalism and, and try to protect the consumer, perhaps not only from herself, but with, um, with an idea of protecting consumers on a more long-term span, perhaps, perhaps including also the children of the consumer or the, the consumers on the other side of the, the globe and, and not be so sort of short-sighted in our way of approaching sort of the consumer welfare or well-being concept. But these are, of course, enormous questions and also even uh, have a little bit of sort of philosophical air to them, like so how, how far can you go? But it's really part of the ongoing debate right now in the competition law community. Um. Terrific. So uh, I think that is a nice segue to our last slide and uh, the couple of big questions that we still have on the table that I would like to ask. So I want to talk a little bit about the remedies, but let me first follow up on your very last question when you bring up, for instance, sustainability. And, and my question is that I think it is a very brave, it's a bold book inviting us to really rethink the, the, the soul of competition law and the boundaries of competition law. So do you have any concerns if we are trying to move away from the kind of efficiency paradigm and, and thinking about antitrust in more political terms? Because if you even think about today's very politicized environment, where we are now trying to harness competition law as a tool for industrial policy, if you ask Germany and France, for instance, and they lay these propositions of how to reform the EU competition law, if we start using this tool to improve environmental goals, the privacy goals, can we lose something important, something valuable in the process? And how can we ensure that that will not happen? That's an excellent question. But I think when we talk about sustainability, one important um, uh, insight is that actually right now, competition law is, is a little bit of an obstacle to achieve sustainability. Currently, there are companies who would like to cooperate uh, for sustainability uh, purposes, but because they are competitors on the market, they are afraid to do so because of uh, the, the regulation concerning cartels and the risks related to cartel-like behavior. So currently, competition rules even hinder us from achieving sustainability goals. So I think sort of as a first point, we should look at the competition rules in place today and see how they can at least enable these goals um, before we talk about you know, stretching them too far and, and starting to drive uh, too many sort of objectives that they are not best placed to do, because of course we have other means to, to, to preserve, for example, sustainability or drive sustainability instead of competition rules. But I think another point that I want to emphasize that we are really seeing something uh, something of a new paradigm, paradigm shift in, in EU competition law enforcement, because uh, not since the 1989 introduction of EU merger uh, regulation has there been um, a proposal such as the one right now, where the EU competition commissioner is considering a completely new competition tool uh, and is considering uh, changing the merger thresholds into value-based thresholds. So, I mean, these are enormous changes that would completely shift the way that competition law is being enforced. And uh, it's, it's really uh, quite extreme because it, it would even shift the burden of proof. So the European Commission would not be the one having to, to prove um, some Ill illegal market uh, practices, but rather it would be the companies having to prove that their market behavior is in the best interest of, of the consumer. So I think, or I thank you for your comment that my book is brave, but I think it sort of reflects what is happening today. There are really big, big questions being posed and we might see some enormous changes that will really sort of um, have, have broad implications for, for the development of competition law and policy.
Yeah, and I think it is a, a sort of genuine uh, recognition and acknowledgement that we cannot necessarily think about just tinkering at the edges of competition law and addressing a really transformed marketplace and the way we go about interacting with consumers and creating value in the data-driven economy. So, Maria, I'm afraid we are in the end of our time. So, um, from my part, I want to just thank you for the opportunity to read and engage with your book. Thank all the listeners uh, for um, their uh, interest. I, I warmly recommend uh, the full read, uh, which certainly transformed my own thinking and gave me a lot more clarity in how I teach and research this topic. But I want to give last word to uh, you, Maria, and but give my warm thanks to everybody. Well, thank you so much Anu, uh, today for participating and thank you for everyone on the line. Um, it's been my pleasure and um, I say let's uh, keep an eye on this topic because it will stay very current also for the years to come. Thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs>